Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror thriller TV series named Two Sentence Horror Stories, Season 4. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The first story begins with two elderly twin sisters. Despite their age, they live together in a large house. The sister Mabel keeps mice as companions while her sister prefers dolls. The house is cluttered with all sorts of junk and the hygiene leaves much to be desired. Yet the two elderly women take care of each other and live quite contentedly. In reality, both of them are just pitiful souls abandoned by society. When she was young, Mabel was a big star. However, time is unforgiving, and her lifestyle choices in her youth left her unmarried for life. Her sister, on the other hand, married a scoundrel and had an ungrateful son. This son found her too neurotic to live with, so the sisters eventually decided to live together in the large house Mabel had bought during her prime. One morning, as they were enjoying breakfast, the doorbell rang. It was a caretaker hired by the sister's son to look after the two elderly women. The caretaker was a tall, handsome man. The sister liked him, but Mabel was not impressed. The caretaker suggested giving them a health checkup. While alone with the sister, he brought up the idea of moving them into a nursing home and handed her a brochure. The sister knew Mabel well and believed she wouldn't like being in a place where they were constantly monitored. She was grateful to Mabel because it was she who took her in during her lowest point. Their current lifestyle was sustained by the money Mabel had earned as a star. Seeing that persuasion was ineffective, the caretaker mentioned the sister's son and grandson. He implied that if they moved into a nursing home, the son wouldn't worry about his grandson being bitten by Mabel's mice and would visit them more often. He also secretly told the sister that Mabel kept the mice to deter her son from visiting. Then, the caretaker went to Mabel to check her health. Mabel bluntly asked how much her sister's son had paid him to spy on them. Mabel even tried to call the sister's son, but no one answered. She explained that she had stopped her sister from talking to her son because he always called to insult them. To prevent her sister from breaking down, she had warned the son to only call if he had something nice to say. Little did she know her sister had overheard everything. Shocked and hurt, the sister couldn't believe what she heard. At that moment, she didn't care about Mabel's good intentions. She only knew that Mabel had prevented her from contacting her son. The more the sister thought about it, the angrier she became. She decided to get back at Mabel, so she smashed Mabel's beloved mice and flushed them down the toilet. Hearing Mabel's heartbroken screams in a chicken voice, the sister's anger subsided. Devastated, Mabel held a farewell ceremony for her mice and placed them in a makeshift mausoleum she had built for them. While mourning her mice, she noticed a pair of scissors on the mausoleum. With only two people in the house, it was clear that the perpetrator was none other than her sister. Determined to take revenge, Mabel began to plot her own retaliation. She brought breakfast as usual, carrying a cup of tea for her sister. Perhaps feeling remorseful, the sister began to explain why she killed her little pet. The sister often asked if her son had contacted her, and she always lied, saying no. The sister was speaking passionately, but Mabel remained calm, asking why she wasn't drinking her tea. Without suspicion, the sister took a sip. Then she noticed the rusty scissors by Mabel's side and saw a button floating in the tea, which suddenly sparked a memory. Panic-stricken, she ran back to her bedroom. Sure enough, her beloved doll had its eyes gouged out and was discarded in the corner. Mabel had also gouged out the eyes in the photos of her nephew in her room, and worse was to come. As the sister was still upset about the photos, Mabel began playing recordings of her nephew's complaints over a loudspeaker. Her son's rejection was piercing to her ears. She begged Mabel to stop, but she didn't. Eventually, the sister couldn't take it anymore and broke down, crying like an old giant baby while holding her little Barbie doll. Once loving sisters, they had now become bitter enemies. Some while later, the caretaker returned and immediately flattered Mabel, reminiscing about her days as a big star. Delighted by the praise, she offered him some moldy cheese. The caretaker, nearly gagging, continued to discuss her past glories. Suddenly, a piece of music played, causing Mabel to panic. Grabbing a dinner knife, she went to find her sister, with the caretaker following. The sister was playing a recording of Mabel's old stage performances, alongside news clippings of how she ruined a show due to drunkenness, something she never wanted to be reminded of. Enraged, Mabel tore the clippings off the wall, and the sister took the opportunity to escape. The caretaker tried to follow, but got lost in the cluttered house. Meanwhile, the sisters began destroying each other's possessions. Mabel cut up her sister's wedding dress, while the sister smashed Mabel's old marquee sign. 
They argued, voicing their long-held grievances. The caretaker, still lost in the maze of junk, eventually stumbled upon the scene just as a tussle caused the mausoleum of mouse bones to collapse, scattering the remains. Devastated, Mabel could only watch as her sister cruelly stepped on one of the bones. In retaliation, Mabel threw her nephew's baby teeth into the air like confetti. While collecting the teeth, the sister found a letter in the caretaker's bag. Then, a cry from the sister caught Mabel's attention. Despite their feud, Mabel rushed to her sister's side and found her sobbing in her room. The bag contained their jewelry and the letter, revealing that the sister's son had died from cancer. The sisters wept together, but their sorrow was interrupted by the caretaker's call. Hearing him mention the son again, they realized he had been deceiving them. With a newfound resolve, they prepared to confront him. The caretaker, seeing the scattered teeth, was then knocked out by the piled-up junk. When he awoke in darkness, he used his phone's light to navigate the clutter. The sister's voice called out, saying they had agreed to go to the nursing home, he suggested. Elated, the caretaker sought their signatures, only for Mabel to stab him with the rusty scissors. As he recoiled in pain, planning to retaliate, he was struck from behind by the sister. It turned out, the caretaker had previously exploited the sister's son during his illness, stealing their money and property. Pretending to be acting on behalf of their son, he aimed to swindle them out of their house and Mabel's money. With the caretaker subdued, the sisters reconciled. Their home, once filled with mice and dolls, now had a new member, the caretaker who had eaten so much moldy food that his complexion had turned pale. The second story begins with a nature lover, Jeremy, who adores green plants. He has a boyfriend, Christian, an IT elite who rarely leaves home, relying on artificial intelligence for both work and daily life. For the sake of his beloved Jeremy, Christian has begun planning to buy their love nest. On his way home, Jeremy noticed a plant abandoned by the roadside and decided to bring it back to Christian's house. Once home, he carefully placed the plant on the dining table and set down the cake he had bought. Today was their anniversary. Christian, still busy with work, promised to join Jeremy later to celebrate. Jeremy had grown accustomed to this kind of disappointment. Trying to change the subject, Christian's gaze fell on the strange plant. Before Jeremy could warn him to be careful, Christian pricked his hand on the plant's thorns. Jeremy helped him stop the bleeding, explaining that he had brought the plant for Christian. The idea was for Christian to spend less time on electronic devices and more time with living things. He asked Christian to take good care of the plant. Interestingly, the plant seemed almost sentient, reacting to Christian's presence. Christian, unimpressed, half-heartedly agreed and returned to his computer. Time passed, and Jeremy found himself celebrating their anniversary alone. When Christian finally appeared, Jeremy was visibly upset. Christian tried to kiss him to make amends, but was interrupted by an AI reminder to hydrate. Jeremy was exasperated, believing that a normal person shouldn't need AI to remind them to drink water. As Christian attempted to explain, his phone and computer both chimed with work notifications. Furious, Jeremy expressed his feelings, but Christian, busy replying to messages, wasn't listening. Jeremy was utterly disappointed and decided to take a break from their relationship and left the tech-occupied house. After Jeremy left, Christian drank, not regretting his actions, but pondering what kind of plant it was. When he tried to touch it, the plant's tendrils wrapped around his hand, injuring him again. Enraged, Christian threw the plant into the trash. The next morning, Christian, still groggy, sat on the sofa and saw the plant, now back on the living room table and seemingly larger. Assuming Jeremy had returned to tidy up, Christian took a photo of the plant to search for its identity online but found no information. As he left, he didn't notice the plant moving in his direction. Back at his computer, Christian began to feel itchy, discovering a thorn in his palm. He pulled it out but couldn't investigate further due to work. Soon, he felt dizzy and stood up, only to instinctively face a beam of sunlight like a plant performing photosynthesis. When he regained his senses, it was night. He couldn't remember the day's events and anxiously checked his missed calls. Among them was a message from Jeremy, hoping to talk. Just then, the home cleaning robot made a strange noise, ensnared by the plant's tendrils. Annoyed, Christian cut the tendrils with scissors, which retaliated by injuring him again. Realizing the plant was unusual, Christian asked his AI assistant the fastest way to kill a plant. The AI suggested using salt and vinegar. Christian, having both at home, applied them generously to the plant, determined to ensure it wouldn't survive. In the middle of the night, a strange noise suddenly came from outside the room. Christian woke up with a start, thinking Jeremy had returned. He called out a few times, but there was no response. Suspecting a burglar, he grabbed a baseball bat and ventured out. 
Just a few steps in, he stepped into some disgusting, sticky slime. The kitchen was in disarray, and when he checked the sink, the plant that had been soaked in salt and vinegar was gone. He turned around to find the plant, now larger than it was in the morning, sitting perfectly fine on the living room table. Christian was bewildered, wondering if he was dreaming. The plant's bud was full, as if it was about to bloom. Christian leaned in close, trying to discern something from the bud. Suddenly, an unknown slime sprayed out, covering his face. Unwilling to give up, he tried microwaving the plant to get rid of it. The plant died, and he thought peace had returned. However, Christian's health deteriorated, and his work became a mess. Eventually, he was coughing so much that he couldn't even give commands to his AI assistant. Suddenly, it was as if the electronic devices around him were interfering, producing an ear-piercing noise that drove him to collapse. The next morning, as sunlight streamed into the room, Christian, like a plant, instinctively sat up to absorb the sunlight despite being unconscious. When he woke again, it was evening. He was roused by the ringing phone, and as he struggled to move towards it, he found his fingers covered in thorns. Christian headed to the bathroom, pulled out the thorns with tweezers, and tried to use the AI to call for help, but he couldn't form a complete sentence. He sent a distress message to Jeremy, then felt something trying to emerge from his mouth, a plant root, stained with his blood. He sensed something wildly growing inside him, straining his clothes to the point of bursting. Desperate for a weapon, he found only an electric shaver and decided to make do. Finally, Jeremy received the message and rushed back to find the house in chaos. He called out Christian's name but got no reply. Following a noise, he discovered Christian in the bathtub, transformed into a plant. A year later, Jeremy sat outside the love nest Christian had bought for him, leisurely sipping tea. At that moment, Jeremy felt truly happy because his long-held wish had come true. Now, Christian was the closest to nature anyone could be. It's true what they say, lovers will eventually find their way to each other. The third story begins with a young boy, Pete, going camping with his classmates. In broad daylight, Jeremy began telling ghost stories, seemingly to scare the girls present to wet their pants, but in reality, to prank the timid Pete. Sure enough, a person wearing a skull mask suddenly jumped out and sprayed Pete with a water gun. Seeing Pete in such a sorry state, everyone burst into laughter. The person in the skull mask was Pete's friend, Hoodie Guy. Another classmate, Wes, kept recounting past pranks on Pete to the girls. Just when Pete felt really embarrassed, AJ stepped out of the car after changing clothes and told his friends to stop the pranks. After all, it was Pete's last week with them. He then told Pete to go clean up his dirty body. Pete went to the outdoor shower behind the car to wash up. As soon as he undressed, a bucket of bugs was dumped over his head. Terrified, he ran out shirtless, only to be blocked by his friends who were waiting to laugh at him. Hoodie Guy recorded the whole prank on his phone. Though Pete was angry, he laughed his shit off, saying it didn't matter because they were friends. Since only the boys were staying overnight, the girls left first, not wanting to leave them any hormone chances. While setting up the tent, AJ revealed the true purpose of the camping trip, to spend quality time with Pete. Hoodie Guy prepared to upload the prank video of Pete to the internet, but AJ snatched the phone away, insisting on deleting the video. This created a rift among them. Pete was grateful to AJ, feeling he was his only true friend. Ever since Pete got into a prestigious school, the others seemed envious, especially Wes. That night, Wes woke up suddenly, seeing a suspicious figure outside the tent. Scared, he sneaked out and saw the skull mask from earlier. He raised his hands in surrender. Pete gleefully pulled off the mask, revealing that it was all a prank. They live-streamed it, and the others appeared behind Wes, laughing loudly. Enraged, Wes pushed Pete hard, and Pete, bewildered, insisted the livestream was just a joke. As Wes tried to teach Pete a lesson, AJ stepped in to stop them, resulting in a brawl among the friends. During the fight, AJ was thrown aside and a tent stake pierced his neck, killing him instantly. No one anticipated such a tragic turn. The panicked Pete wanted to call the police, but the others stopped him. At that moment, distant lights approached. Wes suggested they move AJ's body to the car and drive away. Suddenly, AJ's eyes opened, causing Pete to scream in terror. This distracted Wes, causing him to lose control of the car, forcing it to stop. Wes blamed Pete for being a coward. Pete explained that AJ's eyes had opened, but no one believed him. Pete tried to convince the others to call the police, arguing it was an accident. The others disagreed, thinking the police would pin everything on them. With a flat tire, they split into two groups, Hoodie Guy and Jeremy to change the tire, and Wes and Pete to bury AJ's body. Dragging AJ's body through the forest, they found a clearing to dig a grave. Wes told Pete to gather some branches nearby. As soon as Pete left, AJ's body mysteriously appeared in front of Wes. 
terrified, Wes assumed Pete was behind it. Furious, Pete insisted he would never joke with AJ's body because he was his best friend. After finishing their task, the two made their way back, feeling guilty and constantly hearing AJ calling out to them. When they finally returned to the camper, Hoodie Guy and Jeremy were nowhere to be found. Pete then noticed AJ sitting in the driver's seat, grinning at them. They rushed to check inside the car and found AJ's corpse right where they left it. Wes guessed it was another prank by Hoodie Guy and Jeremy. Turning around, he saw someone wearing a skull mask. When he pulled off the mask, he found Hoodie Guy with something stuffed in his stinky mouth, already cold and lifeless. Terrified, they bolted out of the car and bumped into Jeremy, who had just returned from the woods, puzzled about Hoodie Guy's fate. Suddenly, a flashlight beam shone on them, and a voice asked what was going on. It was a nearby patrol officer. Forcing a smile, Wes explained that they had a flat tire and quietly told Pete to deal with the corpse in the car. The officer checked the tire and confirmed it was flat, then asked Wes and Jeremy if they had been drinking. They managed to respond convincingly. The officer wanted to inspect the car, but Jeremy distracted him with small talk. Inside the car, Pete was moving the corpse when AJ's body suddenly called out to him, making him scream like a chicken. The officer heard the chicken noise and insisted on checking inside. Opening the bathroom door, the officer found only Pete, who pretended to be using the toilet. Embarrassed, the officer apologized and shut the door. Feeling awkward, the officer left, informing them that a tow truck would arrive in the morning. Jeremy praised Pete for hiding the body so well, but Wes blamed Pete for the whole situation, saying that ever since Pete got into a prestigious school, Wes had been picking fights. Suddenly, AJ's corpse grabbed Wes from behind. Pete tried to help but was pulled away by Jeremy. Once they reached a safe distance, Pete realized all this trouble stemmed from his failure to cut ties with these friends earlier. He just wanted to hang out like they did in their childhood, not understanding why his friends had become pranksters who insulted him. Jeremy stayed silent but became upset when Pete expressed that AJ was his only true friend. Jeremy showed Pete videos on his phone, revealing that AJ had posted all the prank videos online and that every prank was AJ's idea. Pete couldn't believe that the person he thought was kind to him was actually the one who hurt him the most. Jeremy explained that AJ also worked hard, but resented Pete for taking the scholarship. Finally, Jeremy decided to call the police, but Pete knocked the phone out of his hand. Pete couldn't let this incident ruin his future at the prestigious school. Jeremy wouldn't listen, so Pete picked up a rock and struck Jeremy, killing him in a moment of panic. Realizing he had just killed his friend, Pete sat alone in the woods until dawn. At first light, he ran back to the camper to wipe his fingerprints. Opening the door, he was startled by Hoodie Guy's corpse. His dead friends surrounded him, with Jeremy choking him until he died. When the patrol officer returned with colleagues, they found the camper empty. As the officer turned around, his colleagues scared him with a skull mask. Annoyed by the childish prank, the officer told him to put it away and leave. Little did they know, the five pranksters' corpses watched them and followed, turning it into another inexplicable tale. It's a reminder that pranks should never be taken too far. The fourth story begins with a young girl, Sam, who went to work as a nanny for a wealthy family. A luxury car picked her up and drove her to a grand villa. Strangely, no one came out to greet her. She had to enter the house by herself, take off her shoes, and wait in the entrance hall. There was a large portrait of a little girl hanging on the wall. She casually picked up a magazine to read, but when she looked up, she was startled to see a well-dressed couple standing in front of her. They were the owners of the house and her employers for the night. Sam was grateful to them, but didn't notice their odd expressions and how they kept interrupting her. She was then invited into the living room. Seeing the children's drawings on the table, she eagerly wanted to meet the artist. The husband subtly hinted, and Sam saw a pair of shoes peeking out from under the curtains. She understood and assured her employers that she would take good care of their daughter that night. The employers then left the villa. Sam took out some candy to attract the child, but there was no movement behind the curtain. Instead, something quickly passed behind her. She went to pull the curtain aside but found no one there, just a neatly placed pair of shoes. Suddenly, a hand grabbed her ankle, startling her. She looked down to see a sweet, innocent little girl smiling and telling Sam she had been tricked. Despite being frightened, Sam extended her hand to greet the child. However, like her parents, the little girl ignored Sam's outstretched hand and asked for candy. The girl told Sam that she liked weak people because she enjoyed being the boss. Sam didn't take her seriously, thinking it was just childish talk. The little girl thought Sam was different from previous nannies and invited her to see her toys in her room. On the way, the lights in the house suddenly went out and the girl disappeared. Sam had to use her phone to light the way. 
Hearing a noise nearby, she ran to check it out. As soon as she opened the door, the lights came back on, revealing the little girl with an innocent expression. Sam was a bit annoyed and told the girl not to scare people like that. The girl almost started crying, explaining that she just wanted to test if Sam could see in the dark so they could play hide-and-seek. Feeling she had wronged the girl, Sam quickly apologized. The girl immediately brightened up and introduced her to her dolls. Sam was at a loss for words because the room was filled with dolls, all of them damaged and incomplete as if they had been abused. The girl didn't want Sam to guess who had mistreated the dolls. She personally demonstrated by tearing a doll apart. Sam tried to calm the girl down, who told her she didn't like disobedient things. Sam suggested fixing the dolls, but the girl coldly refused and mocked Sam for being a nanny with no future. The girl's strong-willed mother had instilled such ideas in her. Sam mentioned she planned to start a small business, hoping to regain some dignity. The girl scoffed at this, saying Sam was too kind to succeed as successful people needed to be controlling like her and her mother. The girl then invited Sam to play a businesswoman training game. Looking at the room full of broken dolls, Sam felt uneasy. The girl brought out her mother's business suit, insisting Sam put it on. Sam struck a deal with the girl. She would change clothes if the girl would be more polite. The girl agreed and let Sam go to the bathroom to change. However, the door wouldn't open. The girl proudly tapped her wristwatch and the door opened. The girl had prepared everything, eagerly awaiting Sam in the suit, but Sam felt it was inappropriate and didn't change. Disappointed, the girl invited her to sit down and added something to the tea they were about to drink with the broken dolls. Sam felt like she was going crazy. She tasted the tea, which had a strange flavor. While the girl wasn't looking, she secretly switched her cup with an empty doll's cup. Sam's phone rang, but the girl snatched it and threw it into the teapot. As Sam was about to get angry, she began to feel dizzy, realizing the tea had been spiked. She tried to escape, but the girl walked up to her, grabbed her forehead, and started chanting a spell. In the last moment, Sam broke free, only to find one of her eyebrows had turned into the same material as the doll's. Before she could figure out what was happening, the girl muttered to herself, wondering why the spell hadn't worked, suspecting Sam hadn't drunk all the spiked tea. Sensing danger, Sam tried to flee, but the house's doors were locked by the girl. As Sam ran elsewhere, she was blocked by the damaged dolls, which even cut her feet. The girl had become demonic, ignoring Sam's pleas, while the broken dolls relentlessly pursued her. The house was too large. She couldn't find a room to hide in. Finally, Sam opened a door. It was the little girl's bedroom that she had visited earlier. She blocked the door and tried to escape through the window, but all the windows were sealed shut and wouldn't open. Desperate, Sam searched the closet for a weapon to defend herself. Inside, she found ID photos of previous nannies who had worked for the little girl. The girl stood outside the door, urging Sam to obey and open it. She commanded the dolls in the room to capture Sam. The broken, tattered dolls began to close in on her. Terrified, Sam hid in a corner. As the dolls approached, she noticed the scattered ID photos on the floor. A bold theory crossed her mind. These dolls were the previous nannies who had worked for the girl. Sam held up an ID photo to a doll, confirming her suspicion. She promised the dolls that she would save them and remove the weapons embedded in their bodies. Moved to tears, the dolls watched as Sam worked to free them. As she turned around, she saw more dolls holding their broken limbs, waiting for her help. Outside, the little girl grew impatient and began banging on the door, but Sam's priority was to save the dolls. She freed them from their restraints and reassembled their broken parts. Just as she finished, the girl broke into the room. Seeing the repaired dolls, she was furious. She commanded the dolls to kill Sam, but they remained motionless, staring blankly at the girl. Sam told the girl that her actions were wrong and that she still had hope of becoming a better person. However, she was once again deceived by the girl's innocent demeanor. The girl grabbed Sam's hand and attempted to cast another spell. Luckily, a doll slashed the girl's leg, breaking the spell and saving Sam. This betrayal enraged the girl further. She tried to confront Sam but was blocked by the dolls. With the doll's guidance, Sam quickly escaped the room. As soon as she left, the door slammed shut and she heard the girl's piercing screams. Ignoring the noise, Sam ran out of the villa. At the gate, she encountered the returning employers. They had always known about their daughter's evil deeds but allowed them to continue to avoid becoming dolls themselves. Seeing the couple, Sam fled in terror. The employers, now turning into doll-like figures themselves, watched her go. Shortly after, Sam fulfilled her dream of opening her own kindergarten. 
One day, her assistant handed her a donation box to choose suitable toys. To her shock, inside was a doll identical to the one the little girl used to wear, suggesting that the nightmare was far from over. The fifth story takes place at a night when Kara and her girlfriend were driving to a mountain cabin for a vacation. They got lost along the way. Kara had planned this trip to deepen their relationship, but her girlfriend seemed reluctant and kept making excuses. Distracted by their conversation, they accidentally hit an animal crossing the road, forcing them to stop. Kara wanted to get out and check, but her girlfriend insisted they drive a bit further to a gas station and ask for directions there. When they arrived, the gas station's dog suddenly started barking at them. The owner quickly intervened, but noticed the blood and damage on their car. Kara's girlfriend calmly answered his questions and then tried to leave. The owner, glaring at her, mentioned that their kind wasn't welcome in the town. Kara wanted to argue about possible discrimination, but was stopped by her girlfriend, who urged her to leave quickly, noticing the burly men and the dog. After they left, the gas station owner tasted the diabetic blood that had dripped from their car. The couple finally reached the cabin. Inside, the girlfriend inspected the surroundings, ignoring Kara's carefully arranged decorations. Just as they were about to get intimate, a knock on the door interrupted them. The girlfriend's reaction was intense, which puzzled Kara. She suggested it might be a welcome gift from the cabin owner. The girlfriend quickly drew the curtains, and Kara, noticing her anxiety, suggested she take a relaxing bath while she collected firewood outside. While gathering firewood, Kara felt like she was being watched. Meanwhile, her girlfriend seemed to sense something, too. Kara returned with the firewood, and her girlfriend, having finished her bath, warned her that the place was unsafe and suggested they go to a boutique hotel in town. Kara thought her girlfriend was upset about the gas station incident and just wanted to enjoy a quiet weekend together. As they talked, the girlfriend hesitated, trying to reveal her past. Suddenly, she heard a noise and told Kara someone was coming. The lights went out, and bright lights shone through the windows. It was the men from the gas station. Kara tried to call the police but couldn't get through. Her girlfriend urged her to lock the doors, but it was too late. Kara was grabbed by the hair. Fortunately, her girlfriend managed to shut and lock the door. Kara suggested they leave the cabin, but her girlfriend insisted they go upstairs and lock themselves in a room, promising to protect her, using her skinny muscles. Kara doubted how two women could fend off several men and a dog. Her girlfriend swore to protect her. Suddenly, Kara saw something strange outside the window, but was pulled upstairs before she could get a clear look. As she tried to understand what she saw, her girlfriend blocked the door and started confessing, making Kara faint. When she awoke, she was alone, hearing her girlfriend's growls outside. She cautiously left the room, finding bloodstains everywhere. She picked up a flashlight and discovered the gas station owner dead, his neck gruesomely injured. Terrified, Kara tried to go downstairs but was paralyzed by the howls outside. She attempted to call for help again but failed. With no other option, she continued down, the howls growing louder. As she reached the door, it slammed shut, and her girlfriend's voice told her to stay inside. Curious, Kara peeked out the window and saw her girlfriend ripping off a creature's head. Her girlfriend returned, but Kara was shocked and unsure how to react. Her girlfriend explained that the creature was a werewolf and that the area was their territory. Kara then noticed her girlfriend's red eyes and fangs. She was a vampire. This revelation explained why her girlfriend had been hesitant about intimacy. She had planned to reveal the truth this weekend, but the events took an unexpected turn. Kara refused to listen, calling her girlfriend a monster and saying hurtful things. Heartbroken, her girlfriend walked towards the now brightening window where sunlight began to scorch her skin. Knowing that sunlight could kill vampires, Kara couldn't bear to lose her and embraced her, finally accepting her for who she was. They reconciled and stayed together. The sixth story begins with a woman, Shiraz, waking up, only to discover that her forehead was scratched. She found herself lying in a basement which contained a small operating table and various other well-equipped medical tools. Shiraz quietly sneaked out of the basement. After confirming that the house was empty, she cautiously moved around, noticing the dining room in disarray. She took a few more steps forward and saw a man rummaging through the house as if searching for something. The man seemed impatient, angrily tossing aside a bag he was holding. Terrified, Shiraz stayed silent, watching him search. She noticed that the front door was locked and saw the man find a surgical knife. She began to slowly retreat, but accidentally stepped on a piece of broken glass, making a noise. Panicking, she hid her smelly body under a table. The man, hearing the sound, started walking around the house, calling Shiraz's name and urging her to come out. 
When he left the kitchen and moved to another area, Shiraz quickly emerged from under the table and ran to the front door. She heard the man returning and grabbed a phone just as a call from her father came through. She quickly hung up, but the man heard it. The man demanded that Shiraz hand over the phone. When she refused, he tried to snatch it from her. Then he saw the key around her neck and switched targets, trying to grab the key. During the struggle, the man brandished the surgical knife to intimidate Shiraz. In her desperation, she grabbed a wine bottle and smashed it against the man's leg. Despite his initial advantage, the man quickly found himself overpowered by Shiraz. She picked up the fallen surgical knife and held it against him, forcing him to stay still. The man covertly hid a piece of broken glass he had picked up from the floor. Shiraz tied him up, revealing that this was actually her house and that she had kidnapped the man. It turns out, as a skilled surgeon, Shiraz had deliberately approached and befriended the man, eventually luring him to her home to keep him captive. Her motive was that both the man and her father shared the rare blood type and both needed organ transplants due to serious illnesses. The man's condition was more critical, so he had undergone the surgery first, receiving the donated organs. Shiraz's father, however, still needed a donor, and Shiraz believed the man had taken her father's chance at survival. So she planned to retrieve the organs from the man for her father. As Shiraz prepared the man for surgery, her phone rang. It was her father. Due to poor signal, she only heard static and saw a frightening shadow in the house. Meanwhile, the man used the hidden glass shard to cut his bindings. He attempted to grab the key from Shiraz's neck, leading to another struggle. Despite her efforts, the man overpowered her, taking the key and pushing her heavy body to the ground. He ran to the front door and unlocked it, only to find Shiraz's father standing outside. Just as the man was about to reveal Shiraz's actions, she rushed over and subdued him with a sedative. Satisfied, she watched the man fall unconscious, but then noticed the shadow from earlier taking a more defined shape. Her father questioned her motives, insisting they take the man to the hospital. Shiraz harshly rebuked him, saying that there was no need to pity the man and that everything she did was to save her father's life. Her father disapproved, pleading with her to reconsider her actions, but his illness flared up, strengthening Shiraz's resolve to reclaim the organs. She locked the front door again and went to the basement to prepare. While getting dressed, she saw the shadow once more and tried to reassure herself that it was just a hallucination. The father tried to wake the unconscious man, but the man, under the influence of the drugs, slept like a log. With no other options, the father took out his phone to call the police. Just as the call connected, Shiraz snatched the phone and stomped it to pieces, infuriating her father to the point of nearly triggering another attack. The father tried to reason with her, pleading for her to stop, but Shiraz was fully prepared and had no intention of halting at the final moment. She quickly administered a sedative to her father. Meanwhile, the shadow behind her increasingly resembled her. The man was placed on the operating table, and the surgery commenced. Shiraz made an incision on the man's skin. When the father woke up and found the room empty, he frantically knocked on the door, urging Shiraz to stop the surgery. Initially, the surgery proceeded smoothly, but suddenly the man began to hemorrhage, spraying diabetic blood all over Shiraz's face. Hearing the alarm from the monitor, the father knew something had gone wrong and anxiously banged on the door, asking what had happened. Despite her efforts, Shiraz couldn't stop the bleeding. She saw the shadow again, which extended its hand, prompting her to extract the organ regardless of the man's survival. The monitor went silent. The father, outside the door, realized the man was likely dead as shit. Shiraz placed the organ into a cooler and covered the man's body. As she left, the cloth covering the corpse began to soak with fresh blood. She went to the living room to find her father, only to see him collapsed on the floor. Despite all she had done, she couldn't save her father's life in the end. Moreover, Shiraz's soul had been replaced by the evil within her heart. The seventh story begins with a young boy, Krish, standing hesitantly at his front door, afraid to go inside. His father told him that avoiding the problem was not a solution. Reluctantly, with a bruised eye, Krish got out of the car and followed his father home, feeling as though something was watching him from a distance. The family ran a guest house, and Krish followed his father through the reception area into the kitchen. His mother and sister were preparing food. Seeing Krish's injury, his mother rushed over to ask what had happened. In his rebellious teenage years, Krish turned away and told her he had gotten into a fight with a classmate after an argument. His sister was pleased, thinking he no longer needed to pretend to get along with people he didn't like, but Krish interpreted her words as implying he was weird and incapable of making friends. His mother, believing Krish had misunderstood, began to lecture him about controlling his temper. At that moment, Krish was indeed trying hard not to lose his temper. Seeing his mother's words had no effect, his father stepped in. 
He told Krish that fights had consequences and punished him by making him fold towels at the guest house after school. The punishment began, but Krish had no intention of folding towels. Instead, he sat nearby, doodling. His sister appeared, and Krish assumed she was there to lecture him on behalf of their parents. To his surprise, she came to encourage him instead. She always believed that Krish had something special within him, like his drawing skills. While upstairs, Krish noticed his parents seeing off a guest. Nearby, something seemed to be hiding in the bushes, but Krish didn't investigate further. His father motioned for them to go inside. As soon as they entered, the phone rang. It was a guest calling from one of the rooms to report a broken showerhead and water everywhere. His father went to fetch repair tools, his sister contacted the cleaning staff, and Krish was assigned to stay at the front desk. His mother reminded him that since he wasn't of age yet, he couldn't check guests in. Later that evening, Krish heated up some food for himself and returned to the front desk where he found a friendly-looking man. The man began chatting with Krish and expressed sympathy for the injury on his face, which made Krish lower his guard. The man offered money for a room, but Krish explained that he couldn't help with check-ins and that the man would have to wait for his parents to return. The man didn't push and said he understood, leaving the guest house without taking his money back. Feeling restless, Krish chased after the man with the money and, against his better judgment, checked him in. In return, the man taught him a self-defense move. Krish felt greatly satisfied. While practicing the move alone at the front desk, the lights flickered and suddenly a hand grabbed his neck. Terrified, he screamed in a chicken voice, only to realize it was his sister playing a prank. Annoyed but unable to stay mad at her, he controlled his temper. When his father returned, he saw the man outside the guest house and learned that Krish had checked him in. Krish, fearing a scolding, quietly retreated. His father explained to the man that his son wasn't authorized to check guests in and began asking for the man's details. Just as his father was about to take the man inside to redo the check-in, the man suddenly attacked him with a weapon he retrieved from his car. Meanwhile, Krish was in the laundry room practicing his moves when he heard strange noises outside. He went to investigate and saw the man loading something into his car. Though he found it odd, he didn't say anything. Back at the front desk, Krish's sister informed him that their father had gone missing. Their mother decided to go out with the sister to search, leaving Krish in charge of the front desk and the keys. Feeling something was wrong, Krish followed them outside. Now, both his mother and sister were missing too. As he searched around, he noticed a strange gel-like substance on the doorknob of the man's room. Suddenly, the lights began to flicker, and his sister appeared out of nowhere, running and shouting for Krish to escape. Before he could react, she grabbed his hand and they ran together. Chasing them was the man they had checked in earlier, now transformed into a terrifying monster. With nowhere to hide, his sister took a moment to tell Krish that he was far stronger and smarter than he realized. She revealed that he had a latent power within him, capable of stopping wars. Before she could say more, the man captured her, leaving Krish alone. Knowing he couldn't remain passive, Krish ran to the man's room and discovered some shed skin, indicating the man was either a snake demon or another cold-blooded creature capable of shedding. Krish tried to call for help, but the phone was dead. The man approached, realizing Krish had entered his room. Krish asked why the man had harmed his family. The man revealed that they were of the same species and that their blood held immense power during their first transformation. Confused, Krish listened as the man forced the door open. Seizing the opportunity, Krish escaped through the window. He ran to the laundry room where he broke down in tears, haunted by his sister's words. His pupils began to change color. The man soon found him and tried to provoke him into revealing himself. Using his knowledge of the environment and mirrors, Krish lured the man deeper into the laundry room, then locked the door behind him. Krish returned to the man's room, grabbed the car keys, and opened the car door to find his parents and sister bound in white silk, unconscious. Despite freeing them, they remained unresponsive. The man soon caught up, flexing his shining bald head and kicking Krish to the ground. Remembering his sister's words, Krish closed his eyes, calmed himself, and when he reopened them, he had awakened his powers and transformed. He easily dodged the man's bald attacks, and in their final brawl, he used the self-defense move the man had taught him, successfully subduing him and overshadowing his shining bald head. After defeating the man, Krish freed his family, who quickly regained consciousness. The next day, his parents explained that their guest house served as a way station for aliens needing to integrate into society. Krish was astonished to learn they were all aliens. They disposed of the man in the trash, but despite the ordeal, his parents reminded Krish not to use violence even with his newfound powers. However, they now trusted him to handle check-ins on his own. 
Ironically, the first guest he checked in was the same man they had just thrown away. The eighth story begins with a woman named Leilani, whose home had caught the eye of a real estate developer. To protect their neighborhood, she organized protests with her neighbors. However, fewer and fewer people participated, with some accepting the developer's terms and moving out. While complaining about the situation, Leilani noticed a woman with no arms in the distance, looking terrified and trying to say something to her. A neighbor called out, alerting her to the developer's representative who had shown up again. When Leilani turned back, the woman had vanished. The representative was there to present them with a new sales contract, which was valid until midnight. Angrily, the neighbors left. The representative told Leilani that this contract offered better terms and advised her to sign for her family's sake. Leilani took the contract home. Just as she tried to spend time with her daughter, her daughter ran off silently. Her husband reminded her that she had forgotten about their plan to bury a time capsule with their daughter due to her focus on the protests. It wasn't the first time such an incident had occurred. Leilani believed she was fighting for a better future for her daughter. Her husband suggested that reconciling with their daughter was the immediate priority. Leilani went to her daughter's room to apologize, acknowledging she shouldn't have forgotten about the time capsule. She had intended to place her necklace inside, but missed the opportunity. Her daughter believed that without personal items in the time capsule buried in the earth, it wouldn't be protected. Leilani promised her daughter she would take care of herself, and they reconciled. Meanwhile, her husband was reviewing the developer's new contract. When Leilani approached, he awkwardly closed it. They sat down to talk. Leilani knew her husband was unhappy and worried about the protests. He expressed his concerns that the developer had caused them both to lose their jobs, leaving them with no income and facing bankruptcy. He thought they should accept the developer's offer. Leilani disagreed as their home was built by her parents, who had also suffered at the hands of developers and were forced to leave their home. Now it was happening to them. Her husband felt that only by staying alive could they continue to fight against those who destroy others' homes. In his view, signing the contract was the best thing they could do for their family at the moment. Leilani wanted to avoid the issue, planning to discuss it the next day, but the contract was only valid for a few more hours. At midnight, Leilani had a dream. She found herself in her daughter's room, where someone lay under a blanket. When she pulled it away, it was the same armless woman from that morning. The woman was speaking continuously, but Leilani couldn't hear anything due to a piercing noise. Eventually, the woman vanished, and Leilani woke up in fright. Her husband was no longer beside her. Thinking it was just a nightmare, she didn't realize the horror that was about to unfold. Leilani walked out of the bedroom and saw the sales contract on the table. Just then, she heard her daughter calling her. She pocketed the contract and went to her daughter's room, but found it empty. Thinking her daughter was playing hide-and-seek, she began searching the house. She saw food scattered on the dining table and assumed her daughter was responsible, angrily calling out for her. Hearing sounds from the bathroom, she thought her husband was taking a shower and pulled back the curtain, only to find no one there. She turned off the faucet, still thinking it was a prank by her husband and daughter. Suddenly, she noticed all the family photos in their frames were gone, and the familiar decor of their home had vanished, replaced by an unfamiliar setting. In disbelief, she saw a shadow pass behind her and chased after it, but found no one. Relieved to see her daughter's room unchanged, she took a breath. The shadow passed again, and she went outside to call her husband, but couldn't reach him. Even their car had been replaced by a different one. Hearing a child calling for their mom, she rushed back inside, hoping it was her daughter, only to find a stranger, a woman with a child, who demanded to know why Leilani had broken into their home. They seemed like the genuine residents of the house. Leilani tried to explain she was the real owner, but noticed that the family photos now displayed this woman's family. Realizing it was all a scheme by the developer to drive them out, Leilani argued. But the woman, not understanding, threatened to call the police. Furious, Leilani demanded to know where her family was and ran to her daughter's room. However, the room had been completely redecorated as if another child lived there. Distraught, Leilani noticed her ring on the floor and saw that one of her fingers was missing. Before she could process this, the woman swung a baseball bat at her, telling her to leave. Leilani ran outside, scaring the child, and saw another finger disappear. She realized something was terribly wrong. Seeking help, she went to a neighbor's house, only to find them in a worse state, with their legs missing, crawling on the floor. The neighbor told her she should have signed the contract and then disappeared before her eyes. Finally, Leilani remembered the armless woman trying to tell her that signing the contract was the only way to save her family. Regretting her decision, she pulled out the now-expired contract from her pocket. 
Desperate, she sneaked back into her house, found a pen by the window, and signed her name. She prayed for everything to return to normal, but the woman and child were still there. Furious, Leilani tried to force her way in, but the woman was terrified by her appearance as Leilani's ears began to disappear. Ignoring this, Leilani went to the yard where her daughter had buried the time capsule. Remembering her daughter's words about the earth protecting those who buried personal items, she dug up the time capsule and placed her necklace inside. As the woman approached with a weapon, Leilani closed her eyes and prayed. In an instant, everything reverted to normal, and the woman vanished without a trace of her smell. She heard her husband calling for her, but her body began to disappear. By the time her husband reached the yard, Leilani was gone. He found the signed contract on the ground, but the writing soon vanished. Just then, the doorbell rang. It was the cunning developer's representative with a new contract, suggesting that Leilani's husband consider signing it for the sake of their family. The ninth story begins with a father, Davis, moving into his new home with his daughter. They were greeted warmly by the landlady, who welcomed them with a bottle of wine. Davis recognized the wine as being from a famous local vineyard, which he learned was owned by the landlady's family. Knowing Davis was a recent widower living alone with his daughter, the landlady expressed sympathy and offered her assistance, mentioning that she lived nearby. As Davis explored the house, he realized his daughter had run outside. He quickly chased after her and found her across the street. Angry that she had crossed the road alone, his daughter explained that a woman had waved her over. She pointed to a house not far away. The landlady informed them that the house had been vacant for months. Skeptical, the daughter insisted that the woman had warned her the house was unlucky. Davis dismissed it as childish imagination and reassured her that the new house had her own room, a playroom, and a large yard. The landlady added that there was also a swing in the yard inviting the daughter to see it. The swing was tied to a large, ancient tree that looked dry and neglected. Davis returned to the house to continue unpacking. Suddenly he saw a figure in the mirror, but when he turned, it was gone. A picture hanging nearby inexplicably fell. As he rehung it, his daughter said her doll was missing. Together, they searched for it, not noticing that the picture depicted the large tree in the yard. That night, a fierce wind howled outside, waking his daughter. She saw her doll near the tree and went outside to retrieve it, taking a swing on the swing while she was there. Meanwhile, Davis's blanket was mysteriously pulled off him as he slept, and he saw a white figure at the foot of his bed. He woke with a start, but the figure was gone. Hearing his daughter humming outside, he looked out to see her by the tree and rushed downstairs. His daughter was happily playing, but suddenly the swing's rope cut her hand. A dark shadow enveloped the area, and by the time Davis arrived, the swing was empty and his daughter was gone. Desperately shining a flashlight around, he saw an old woman holding his daughter's doll. He asked if she knew where his daughter was, but she only said the house was unlucky and ran off pretty fast, like a Tesla bike despite being old. Davis tried to chase her, but tripped. Searching the house and yard thoroughly, he found no sign of his daughter. With no other options, he called the police, but they told him he needed to wait 24 hours to report a missing person. Frustrated, Davis made and distributed missing person flyers. The landlady kindly offered to help. When Davis mentioned the old woman, the landlady claimed not to know her, insisting no such person lived in the town. That night, Davis couldn't resist going back into the yard. To his surprise, he found iron wires tied to the swing's ropes, stained with what appeared to be his daughter's blood. He also noticed her hair ribbon caught in the tree branches. The next day, the old woman appeared with an axe, furiously chopping at the tree. Davis rushed to stop her. She repeated that the tree was cursed, explaining that it wasn't she who took his daughter, but the tree itself. Then, the woman tearfully recounted how her father had also been taken by the tree. She told Davis that if he heard the sound of a lullaby, he might have a chance to save his daughter. Skeptical, Davis saw the woman's terrified gaze shift behind him. Turning around, he saw two ghostly figures inside the house. When he looked back, the old woman had fled for her shitty life, leaving the axe behind. That night, Davis heard a lullaby. Excited, he rushed to the yard to find his daughter, but as he opened the door, it slammed shut with a force he couldn't see. Struggling to open it again, he was startled by the ghost of a man outside. Panicking, he tried another door, only to find a woman's ghost waiting there. Trapped, he attempted to escape through a window, but they were all sealed shut. Three ghostly figures emerged inside the house, slowly approaching him. Suddenly, Davis heard his daughter calling for him. Overcoming his fear, he bolted out the door. Now convinced that the strange tree was behind his daughter's disappearance, he picked up the axe the old woman had left and began chopping the tree. To his horror, the tree bled profusely. 
As he worried about whether the blood was his daughter's, he was attacked from behind by the landlady. The landlady revealed she had always known about the tree's sinister secret. It thrived on human blood. By feeding the tree every 30 years, it ensured the land's fertility. This was the reason for the fame of the landlady's vineyard. Davis, uninterested in the landlady's boasting, demanded to know where his daughter was. The landlady didn't answer, and instead picked up the axe, intending to use Davis as the tree's next meal. Just as Davis feared for his life, the old woman reappeared and stabbed the landlady from behind. In a twist of fate, the landlady fell to the ground and was swallowed by the tree, including her smelly part. Through the thick smoke that followed, several ghostly figures emerged. The old woman recognized her father among them. These figures were the landlady's victims, deceived and sacrificed to the tree. However, Davis couldn't find his daughter among them. A gust of wind dispersed the apparitions, and the old woman bid a final farewell to her father. Disheartened, Davis refused to believe his daughter was lost forever. Just then, he turned around to see his daughter running towards him, alive and well. They embraced, tearfully. Deciding to leave the cursed place, Davis and his daughter prepared to depart. The old woman, however, chose to stay. The story leaves one lingering mystery, why the tree remained. The likely answer is that the old woman stayed behind to use the tree for revenge against the landlady's family. The tenth story begins with a young boy named Axel, his cheek injured, running out of a large house. Inside the house, something seemed to be trying to break out. Years later, Axel returns as an adult. His aunt, opening the door, is stunned to see him. After all, Axel hadn't been back in years. This return wasn't by choice, but because his father was critically ill and urgently summoned him home. Axel wasn't alone. His two older brothers and a host of relatives were also there. Alone at his father's bedside, Axel sent the nurse away. His father apologized, revealing that when Axel was conceived, his mother was already quite old and died in childbirth. Blaming Axel for this, his father had harbored resentment. But Axel didn't care about that. He returned for a more important reason. Axel was a recovering addict and had been haunted by troubling memories since getting clean. Reading his father's handwritten notes, some memories resurfaced vividly. He returned home to seek answers from his father. Flipping through a book, Axel remembered how his father's temper worsened with alcohol, saying that the legendary monster, Coco, with a crocodile head and a woman's body, would appear during these fits. His father suddenly grabbed his hand, urging him to stop his bullshit. Feeling his father's anger and fearing the monster's appearance, Axel fled the room. His two brothers were waiting outside. The eldest brother was displeased, suspecting Axel had returned for the inheritance, shaming the family with his addiction. Though Axel explained he was clean, his brothers remained skeptical. In the bathroom, Axel found claw marks on the mirror. As he touched them, the monster scratched his hand. Terrified, he wanted to flee. His second brother tried to stop him while the eldest mocked him. Frustrated, Axel showed his wounded hand, claiming it was the Coco monster he had mentioned as a child. The eldest brother dismissed it as a desperate bid for attention, thinking Axel had self-harmed. The second brother tried to mediate, urging them not to fight. Exhausted by their disbelief, Axel insisted the monster was linked to their father's outbursts. The eldest brother walked away, and the second brother, though wanting to believe, found the story far-fetched. Ultimately, they convinced Axel to stay. He began searching the house for clues, overhearing visitors praising his father as a great man. He tore a page from his father's book about the Coco monster. That evening, their aunt informed them that the nurse was off-duty and she needed rest. She asked the three brothers to look after their father. The older brothers agreed, seeing it as a chance to spend time with him. Axel, however, was reluctant, fearing another attack by the monster. But in the end, he was guilted into staying by his aunt. Three bored brothers sat in the living room. At the slightest sound, Axel would jump up, asking his brothers if they heard it. They thought he was overreacting. The second brother even joked about going to check it out, saying he'd take a picture if he encountered the Coco monster. He then headed to the garage. In the garage, the second brother saw a rocking chair moving. He approached and noticed something claw-like in the corner, which quickly withdrew. The lights flickered, and he was attacked. Axel rushed over and saw claw marks on his brother's clothes. The second brother was influenced by Axel's talk of the Coco monster and reassured him, saying he probably just tripped over old stuff in the garage. He told Axel to relax and not always see the dark side of things. But only Axel noticed the claw marks on the old boxes in the garage. The eldest brother thought Axel was making things up. He told Axel to be grateful for everything their father had given them. Axel felt wronged, having lost his mother at birth and being left alone to face their father's temper while his brothers left home early. The eldest brother argued that the father Axel spoke of was not the one he knew. 
Axel countered, saying they felt that way because they left home early. Every time their father got angry, the Coco monster would appear. He pushed a book about the Coco monster towards his eldest brother, but he didn't believe him. Frustrated, Axel shoved his brother, who didn't want to fight, and went upstairs to see their father. The eldest brother heard a noise and went into the dressing room to check, but got locked inside and was attacked. Even then, the brothers didn't believe in the Coco monster. Stubborn as ever, they dismissed it. Axel angrily explained that their father's book described their current attacks. Their father had used their pain to write his book, but the brothers still believed their father was a good man. As they argued, their aunt appeared. Axel asked her about the Coco monster, but she said it was just a legend to scare children. Axel was thoroughly disappointed. Everyone urged him to let go of his resentment towards their father, but no one believed him. The terrifying childhood memories suffocated him, making it impossible to let go. Suddenly, an alarm sounded from their father's room. He was in critical condition. Axel was unwilling to let him go without finding out the truth about the Coco monster. With his last breath, their father set his desk before the lights flickered and went out. The monster's growl echoed from outside. This time, all three brothers heard it and realized the Coco monster was coming. Axel urged them to leave, but his brothers were reluctant to part from their father. As Axel left the room, the door slammed shut, trapping his brothers with the Coco monster. He remembered his father's final words and rushed to the desk, searching through the drawers. He found his father's notebook with a picture of the Coco monster. On the back, it read that the Coco monster follows people, dwelling in the darkness of anger. The father even confessed that he inherited the monster from his own grandfather, but he didn't want his sons to inherit the same. It turned out the Coco monster had appeared in their father's childhood too. He didn't want his sons to inherit the monster, but Axel already had. Understanding this, Axel rushed back and opened the door. His brothers were severely injured by the Coco monster, but he realized the monster wasn't summoned by their father, but by himself. The Coco monster approached Axel. He needed to let go of his obsession, forgive his father and everyone else, and let his anger dissipate. As he did, the Coco monster vanished along with his anger. After this ordeal, his brothers finally admitted their mistakes and apologized for not believing him. Axel warned them that the monster could return, lurking in anger. The three brothers reconciled. Their aunt reappeared. The eldest brother told her their father had passed. She expressed regret, praising him as a good man. The eldest brother retorted that their father might not have been as he seemed. Angered, their aunt called them ungrateful. The second brother couldn't hold back and revealed she had known about the Coco monster all along, but kept it from them. She tried to defend herself, but was promptly kicked out by the eldest brother. Their aunt left, and with her went the Coco monster. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.